Good morning. And let me start by thanking you again for your support of the students at Boston University. In a little over a month, um, our students come back and we get to reach out to a, a fresh crop of students. The students that will be with us, uh, most of the student leaders that we work with right now are either brand new Christians or they came out of cult-like churches. And so it's a pretty fresh group of people that we work with. And right now we've graduated out a few of our um, brand new believers. So we need a whole new crop of pre-Christians to come and be a part of our group so that they can hear about Christ and respond to him. One of the things that we work really hard on on campus is to make sure that most of our group doesn't know Jesus. We see the, our work as disciple makers as being like a funnel. There's a narrow way at the end of the funnel, but there's a wide way to come in and be a part of things. And for most of the pre-Christians we work with, they need about a year and a half of learning about Jesus, of, of looking at scripture with us, worshiping with us and the rest before they make that decision. And so we need to make sure that we are the kind of community that people who don't yet know Jesus can rub shoulders with us, can participate with us, can experience Jesus, because otherwise there's little hope that they're going to respond to just an intellectual message. So thank you so much for your help. I'd like to pray and then read the psalm that we have for today. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for, Lord, the many ways you communicate to us. We thank you for this song of, of praise. And Lord, I'll confess as I come into it, this is a, a psalm that I couldn't sing for a long time. But Lord, you give understanding and you give us new frameworks and help us to understand what you have given to us. So I pray, Lord, that we'll be open to you speaking to us and reorienting us today as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've seen the title, if they put the whole title in there, um, for me, the title of this is This Psalm Makes No Sense. According to the gospel I grew up with. And even as we come into listening to this for the first time, context is really important. And we have a cultural context we come in on. And America is a very judgmental, legalistic culture. And oftentimes we have recreated God in that image. But let's listen first to this psalm. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Proclaim his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens." Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of all his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Among, say, among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. And this is where the psalm becomes difficult for me because we've been praising God for all kinds of things. And at the end now, we see what the focus is. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad that the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees in the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. 
He will judge in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. Like I said, everything that we hear and read has a context. And I love this psalm up until the point that I find out that we're praising God because he's going to judge us. And with the gospel I grew up in, that made no sense. Every culture has its boogeyman. A boogeyman is created mostly to scare children into obedience. The boogeyman is dangerous. He's got unknowable motives, he or she. And you don't want the boogeyman's attention, ever. In Spain, the boogeyman is the sack man. Goes around and stuffs disobedient kids in a sack. In Brazil, it's the crocodile man. You can kind of figure out what he does. In Mexico, it's a ghost of a woman wearing white. In Japan, the boogeyman takes disobedient, lazy children or children who cry too much. In Australia, it's a giant frog with red fur. And I'll be honest, I'd like to see that one. In America, we have a lot of different boogeyman, but I think our most famous one is Santa Claus. Think about it for a minute. If you've been in line during Christmas or seen the lines of kids waiting to get their photo taken with Santa Claus, at least half of them are in tears. Why? Well, we've got that famous song, you better watch out. You better not cry, you better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He's got gifts for really good kids. But if you sit, go to sit on his lap and you've been bad, he's probably going to sit on you. <laughs> and there's a bunch of those kids in that line that know what they've been doing and there's no way that they want to sit in the lap of the guy who knows what they've been doing. And the ones that aren't crying are the cynical ones who've survived several Christmases and figured out this thing isn't real. But all of us have this idea of the boogeyman and sometimes in our culture we use God as the boogeyman. And that's where I had trouble with all the excitement in this psalm coming up to this point of God being the judge. I was raised in a place where I was trained to make me an obedient child to be afraid of God. God was a judge, angry at me, out to get me when I stepped out of line. And like every other boogeyman, I didn't want God's attention on me. I kind of knew I wasn't up to snuff. And God has lightning bolts and, man, crispy critters. The idea of, of God being a judge was terrifying. How we understand God depends on what story we place him in. And this is really important for us today. We're living in a time where in places in America, the church is losing ground. We tend to look outside and blame everybody else for that. But let's be honest, the world's been in sin since Adam and Eve. We need to look at us and make sure we're not the ones that have changed. For a lot of people, there's a, an idea of a frame story. And I think scripture gives us a frame story. A frame story is a time when you've got something to say and you start with a story and then you seemingly abandon it and you come back to it later. That frame story is more important than the story inside because it gives context and meaning and the actual purpose of that story. And so our question is, what is the frame story we use? And oftentimes... The frame story for scripture begins in Genesis 3 and ends in Revelation 20. 
It begins with humanity rebelling against God and falling into sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And humanity has to be judged and expelled from the garden. And then it ends in Genesis a couple chapters before the real end when the final judgment comes. And so our whole emphasis is on personal salvation. Are you in or are you out? And unlike the songs that we sang this morning, which are the right orientation that we should be in, we begin to look at God as the person who's out to get us. Everything is about judgment. And while we talk about the grace of God, the story we tell is framed with judgment. And then we think of the work of a judge as being to condemn us, that that Jesus can't wait to throw us into hell if we don't match up. And that's not a very compelling gospel. The frame story should be Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. And this is a different story. It begins with God making an ordered and good creation out of chaos. And his role as a judge is to do just that. And we can see him making this judgment after each day of this work of ordering where he says, and it was good. We see God taking chaos and turning it into something that we can live in, giving us purpose and meaning, a place where we can thrive. And the primary job of a judge is not to condemn us, but to protect us. Primary job of a judge is not to sentence people, it's to help create an environment where we can all thrive. The work of a judge is to bring order out of chaos. And so the story begins with God creating a good creation and then we sinned and screwed it up. We sinned and we brought hell into this world and we brought hell into our lives. Now I very much believe in a very real physical, spiritual hell. But the concept of hell is bigger than that. When we sinned, we took this order and we brought disruption into it. We brought fragmentation that has brought nothing but pain from that day forward. And in that way, we have brought hell into our life. We have brought hell into this world. But God is this judge who works against chaos. And from the very moment we sinned, It's interesting, the consequences of sin are already there before man and woman meet God. He doesn't create the mess. But from the very beginning, he tells them the consequences as a warning, and then he begins to work to make it right again. Even the expulsion from Eden We're told that we are expelled because if humanity stayed there, they would never grow and they would never change and they'd be stuck in their sin forever. As a judge, he's trying to bring health into the chaos that we have brought into the world. And the end of the story That order is brought. The story of Scripture that we have been given ends with the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. God makes his dwelling place with man. It's really interesting because I think the story, cultural story we have, is we go to God. But no, God comes here because he is working 
to make creation work again the way he created it to exist, to give us a chance to live in that. As a judge, he's going to separate evil out from that situation because that chaos cannot be allowed to continue to dominate. But he has come to bring liberation, to bring change, to bring something positive. He brings a new heaven and new earth. And there's consequences to that, the here and now or the there and later. If we have that Genesis 3 through Revelation 20 truncated gospel, that becomes very individualistic. Everything God does is for your personal salvation. Now that's important. That's a huge piece of this. But if it stops there, we are still selfish, self-centered, isolated Christians. And we're not part of that work of the holy judge to bring order to the rest of the world. I think if we stay in that Genesis 3 through Revelation 20 gospel, fear still reigns even though we talk about grace. And again, I would just say working with college students today, that is not a compelling gospel. To come up to a student today and start my conversation with, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven or hell? First off, lots of questions as to what I'm even talking about. But that's only the beginning place for a culture that's really guilty. That's my generation of college students. We had enough good gospel around that we knew we were screwing up. We were guilty for it. We needed to start there. This group doesn't know who this Jesus is, why he's here, what his purpose is all about. And they're not looking for an individualistic gospel. They want to change the world. And we should applaud them for that desire. Genesis 1 through Revelation 22 gospel is outward focused. Because God is this good judge that's trying to bring order out of chaos, love out of hatred, security out of fear, we are called to work with him. We are to change the world through the power and love of Christ. And it's important that we shift our understanding. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. In fact, I would argue Jesus sends nobody to hell. People end up in hell. But John 3, 16 and 17, we, we know 3, 16, 17 we should memorize right along with it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Therefore, God did not send you into the world as a Christian to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Our rebellion makes us all fit for hell. And God does not, Jesus does not, and Jesus is our final judge, does not have to condemn us to hell. We are already there. When Jesus judges, he judges through the eyes of his sacrifice a righteousness that is given by him. But his judgment is to bring everlasting life, forgiveness, hope, purpose. Jesus didn't condemn, come to condemn, but to create again. In Romans 8, it, it speaks of Jesus this way. 
What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also among him, along with him give graciously all things? Who can bring any charge against those who God has chosen? And a rhetorical question, God can, nobody else. It is God who justifies, who is the one who condemns? No one, Jesus Christ died. More than that, he was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And so our judge is also our defendant or our lawyer for our defense. He died on the cross to liberate us because he didn't need to judge any of us and send us to hell. That's our starting place. For the Hebrews in the Old Testament, their focus was on today. They didn't know what happened after they died. They're really vague about that. God had not revealed that to them yet. It wasn't until through Jesus that we began to learn about that. They expected God to change the world now, not later. They were looking for a hope that would bring deliverance and change and life into the world now, not when they died. And when Jesus asks us to be a disciple, he asks us into that same work. We are to join him as the judge who is trying to bring life out of chaos. And we are to work now to extend that kingdom in the world around us now. And that is a compelling gospel. Our students could care less about a philosophy or some judgmental thing about the next life that kind of just sounds like you're supposed to sit on your hands for the rest of this one. But if God has a real answer to the real hell that they see around us, they want to be a part of that. If they can link up next to us, we have pre-Christians even doing evangelism with us because they're beginning to be compelled by the message and they want to see if God shows up as they share about him. We have to be in motion if we want to see the gospel work because encounters with God sometimes happen here on Sunday, but most often happen out in the streets as we're doing the work of God in the world around us. I love that we had uh, a gift of tongues. I remember a day when, at least for us in Chi Alpha, we would come together and there would be five to eight words, there'd be words of knowledge, there would be tongues, there would be miracles because we were focused in the right place. The gifts are ministry driven and to drive us into ministry. I want to experience that again. What gospel excites and, modifies and, mod and motivates you? I rejected the church originally because it just seemed to be philosophy and teaching. It just seemed to be morality and a lot of judgmentalism. It wasn't until later that I met Christians that were part of this adventure of joining Jesus in changing the world. And we need to not become cynical about that. We had a staff person join our team a couple years ago. And when I mentioned that my hope was that we would change Boston University forever, that staff person just said, what? That's not even a realistic. I come from a campus, Western Washington University in Bellingham, one of the leading radical hippie drug using campuses on the West Coast that is now a campus that students come from all over the country to, to learn who Jesus Christ is and learn to be his disciple. God brings change. God brings life. So how big is your hope? Israel's hope became huge. And that's why they could sing this song. 
Their God was big and he could change the world. And so I'd like to read this psalm again. In light of understanding the judge that they knew, not the judge that was there to condemn them, because without him they were already condemned, but the judge who created the world out of chaos, the God who is at work today in the midst of sin, bringing order and life and the possibility of love. And so they sang, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim the day, his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glo glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in, in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is within it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. Worship team can kind of move forward. I want us to take a few moments just in prayer. I'd like you to close your eyes for a minute and just think through. As you look at God as a judge, which picture have you grown up with? And, and do you need to ask God to change that picture? God is a judge bringing life where there's death, order where there's chaos. How big is your gospel? Do you believe he's big enough to change your life? If not, then you can pray for his faith to be increased, your faith to be increased. If you do, then thank him for that. Let's take a moment. And then God as judge speaks of change in this world. Have you become cynical? Or do you still believe God can transform our communities? That God can still change the direction of individual peoples? Forget about institutions for a moment. They're just made up of people. Reach the people, the institutions change. If you need faith for that again, ask Jesus for that. If you believe he has the power for that change, then thank him for that. And then lastly, if you're here and you want to join in that work. On one side, you just may have been a God-fearer. And this has all been just about salvation, not about being a disciple and joining in shoulder to shoulder with Jesus and the work he's come into. Then I invite you to tell Jesus 
that you're willing to take a step further with them. If you don't know Jesus, then this vision of, of God that we have in, in the scripture, this vision of Jesus, if you want to be part of his work of transforming this world into something better, then the first step is to tell him that. And let's just take a moment for anybody in, in either of those two situations to say yes to God. And if you're in either of those two situations, then you've seen a lot of people up here in front on the stage. There's other people as well that you could talk to, but definitely grab one of them and say, hey, I, I've made this decision. What comes next? And they'll put you in contact with someone. We are a community that links arms and helps each other grow. And so we very much want you to be a part of that. So Lord, thank you that you are not the boogeyman. Lord, we resist all the attempts to make you that. But Lord, help us to take seriously the hell that we have created on this earth through our disobedience. Help remind us that at some point or another, we were part of the reason it's like it is today. And you in your grace liberated us and changed us and turned us around. Lord, I pray that we would see that continue to ripple through. Lord, that we would see our communities change, we would see our neighbors change, and that, Lord, our gospel to them would be one of the judge that brings order out of chaos, hope out of cynicism and futility. And, Lord, we know most people know how bad it is today, Lord, I pray that they learn how good you are and join in with you. In Jesus' name, amen.